Hello, and thank you for joining the National Center for Rural Road Safety for our Complete Streets for Rural Areas webinar for July of 2022. My name is Jamie Sullivan. I am the director of the National Center for Rural Road Safety, and we're excited to have you all with us today. We're gonna go through um, just a few logistics here for today. The duration of the webinar will be an hour and a half. We do have closed captioning available. Uh, for those of you who requested it, you should have already received this link through email, but it is um, again showing up on the screen and you can also find it in the uh, chat pod as well. A recording for today's webinar will be provided on our website for archival purposes. We will also email it out to everyone who registered for today's webinar. Our phone lines have been muted during today's presentation to make sure that that recording is crisp and clear. Uh, and due to that, we would ask you to please use the question pod that you can find over on the corner of your screen. You can put any questions in there at any time and we'll ensure that uh, those are read out to the trainers when we do stop. There will be three question and answer periods, but again, please feel free to put those in at any time when you come up with a question. Uh, we would also ask that you please complete the survey that will be provided to you at the end of today's webinar just to let us know what additional types of um, themes and topics you'd like to see covered in our upcoming webinars. And additionally, certificates of completion and CEUs will be provided for those of you who um, are with us for at least 75 minutes of the 90 minutes for today's webinar. Today we have three presenters that I'm excited to have online. We have Brooks Druvy from Federal Highway Administration, Jason Hoteling from Missourians for Responsible Transportation, and John Kaplan from the Vermont Agency of Transportation. For today's webinar, our goal is that once you've completed this, you'll have an understanding of how to implement a complete streets policy in your rural area. And for that, we have several different learning outcomes that include to describe the basics for creating a complete street in a rural area, listing the resources available for complete streets in rural areas, describing the complete street process being utilized in a rural area of Missouri, and to identify some low cost and easy to implement changes to your roads to make them work better for people walking and bicycling. Our very first presenter will be Brooke Struvey. She is a safety and design engineer for the Federal Highway Administration's Resource Center. She is based in Colorado, but provides technical assistance and training nationwide on design flexibility, performance-based design decision-making, and designing for pedestrians and bicyclists. During her career, she has worked in FHWA's Office of Infrastructure, Eastern Federal Lands, and for the Utah Department of Transportation, providing design guidance and leading the development and design of projects ranging from low volume recreational roads to urban arterials and freeways. Brooke has a BS in Civil Engineering from Brigham Young University and is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Utah. And now I'm excited to hand it over to Brooke. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, just checking to make sure my controls are working here. All right. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the overarching concepts related to complete streets and provide some information on the federal perspective. I always have to share this disclaimer. I'm not issuing policy as part of this um, presentation, um, please refer to the appropriate laws and regulations for that sort of information. I'm also not endorsing any particular uh, manufacturers or products as well. Um, so getting started, what are complete streets? Well, our deputy administrator, um, Stephanie Pollack, um, uses this definition. A complete street is safe and feels safe for everyone using the street. Uh, another way that we could are describing it as a complete streets approach, meaning you know it's it's really hard to toggle a switch and say that oh this street is complete or that street is not complete. It's sort of a continuum, but we want to be using this complete streets approach as we are developing, planning, administering our transportation programs. And when we do this, we are routinely improving safety and access for all road users. The streets and cities of our cities and towns are an important part of our communities. Uh, they allow children to get to school and parents to get to work. They bring together neighbors and draw visitors to neighborhood stores. These streets ought to be safe 
and designed for everyone, whether they're young or old, on foot or on bicycle, in a car or in a bus, um, but too often they're designed only for the speeding cars or for the creeping congested traffic. Um, right now in communities across the country, a movement is growing to complete the streets. States and cities and towns are asking their planners and engineers to build roads that are safer, more accessible and easier for everyone. In the process, they are creating better communities for people who live, play, work and shop. So why are we focusing so much on complete streets? Um, you know, it would seem apparent because of the, the overall benefits, but one of the primary reasons we as an agency are focusing on it is because of the safety aspects. Um, safety is what we say is our number one priority. And if we really mean that, we need to be thinking about the safety of all of our road users. When we think about transportation deaths, on all modes of travel, meaning airfare or, or air, airlines and freight and um, um, shipping and, and all of those other forms, 90% of our deaths are happening on roadways. Um, the, the number of people that die on our roadways is just a, a number that seems too hard to, to fathom, you know, 38,000 people in 2020, and I know those numbers have been going up recently. And then when you look at our road users who are more vulnerable, people who are walking and biking, um, they are certainly overrepresented. When you consider the, the proportion of travel that is done by walking and biking compared to motor vehicle travel, um, those pedestrian and bicycle fatalities have been increasing at a faster rate. Sometimes it's been hard to get good data to analyze the, the effect on our non-motorized users. Um, we are getting crash modification factors. There's research going on all the time, but still it's creeping behind the knowledge that we have related to motor vehicle crashes, or it's hard to get statistically significant data. But there are some key fake factors of safety that we can address and that we can be looking for in our transportation facilities. And I'll go over these here. And the first one is speed. Speeding is a significant factor contributing to deaths on our roadways. There's various different studies that have come up with slightly different numbers, but they're all telling us pretty much the same story. If you're down at 20 miles per hour, if you're a pedestrian, or I would presume also a bicyclist um, who is in a crash with a motor vehicle, nine times out of 10, that crash is survivable. On the other end of the spectrum, when you get up to 50, 55, 58 miles per hour, if a pedestrian or bicyclist is hit by a car, nine times out of 10, that individual is going to die. Number of lanes is our next factor of safety. When you think about some of the intersections we have, they can be very complicated. And that complexity is just compounded when you have um, more and more lanes and more turning movements and other things happening. And number of lanes usually goes hand in hand with higher volumes of traffic. And it's not necessarily that you're gonna change your high volume roadway into a low volume roadway, but understanding that this is a factor of safety um, you might use some more rigorous countermeasures to treat those facilities to make them um, more safe, more comfortable for the other road users. Next, we have traffic volume and composition. Um, you can have a lot of quiet residential streets that have low volumes and mostly automobiles that can be very comfortable to share that space between PEDs bicyclists and motorists. However, we also have roadways that look more like this. Uh, this is a picture I took in Laredo, Texas, where there's a lot of um, travel to the border crossing and a lot of freight happening. They've got upwards of 80 to 90% truck traffic and the experience there for pedestrians and bicyclists is going to be very different. 
Next are the conflict points. Any place that one road user is crossing the path of another road user is going to be a potential for a crash or a near miss. And so we want to be managing those conflict points, either reducing the number of conflict points, consolidating them, or even making them more conspicuous and visible, making sure that everybody is clear on who has the right of way, um, who goes first, who goes second, maybe separating those conflict points both in time and space. When it comes to visibility and conspicuity, making sure that people know where the other road users are and that they can see them. Sometimes it's highlighting a conflict point to make it more conspicuous. Sometimes it has to do with lighting, making sure that we can see um, our other road users. A lot of our highway lighting is um, designed and built to light the roadway for the motorists, but sometimes it's not lighted in the best way to highlight a pedestrian crossing, for example. Um, this can be an important factor as well. Next, we have proximity. How close a non-motorized user is to motor vehicle traffic can greatly contribute or detract from the safety and comfort of a facility. So finding ways, oops, I don't have a, another picture there, but uh, finding ways to provide some separation in space, whether it's with a buffer, um, whether it's providing a separate corridor or um, other features to give a little more room for those non-motorized users. Next, we have pavement condition. Um, driving down a, a poorly maintained pavement can be uncomfortable and pleasant for a motorist, but it can be downright dangerous for a bicyclist. Something like a pothole or a puddle or even a utility cut that runs longitudinally down the center of a bike lane can, can cause a bicyclist to fall off their bike or even fall into traffic, or they might have to dodge that pothole and end up in a motor vehicle lane. And then for our pedestrians, that um, poorly maintained surface can make the, the pathway completely inaccessible. Our final um, factor of safety is connectivity. We can have a great pedestrian facility or a great bicycle facility, but if it doesn't connect to the destinations where people want to go, um, it's not going to be very useful in terms of an alternate form of transportation. Or, you know, you get to the end of that great facility and you, you get lost um, in, in terms of finding that next step in your journey or you end up in an uncomfortable spot that you did not expect or were not prepared for. So thinking about um, as we, we implement projects, I know we can't build a whole network all at once, but be very thoughtful about how we treat those project termini and providing appropriate transitions. There's a great FHWA publication, um, Measuring Multimodal Network Connectivity, which is where this example comes from. And the appendix to that document has some great examples on how different communities have analyzed and evaluated the connectivity of their pedestrian and bicycle networks. So these are the key factors of safety. Speed, number of lanes, traffic volume and composition, conflict points, visibility and conspicuity, proximity, pavement condition, and connectivity. So, Getting back to the overarching topic of who wants to of, of complete streets, who wants them? Well, walking and transit ridership is growing faster than our population in the US. 65% of people want to live in a community with transportation alternatives, and more than 65% of people surveyed want to live in communities that have well-maintained sidewalks, well-lighted streets and intersections, easy to read street signs, and speed limits that are properly enforced. So when we're thinking about what a complete street is, it's one that provides safety, comfort, and network connectivity. This should sound familiar. A complete street is providing space and access and mobility for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, 
transit riders, micromobility users, shared ride services like Lyft and Uber, motorists, and freight delivery. Complete streets are, are useful to people of all ages and abilities, people who have disabilities, and also people who are in mar marginalized communities who um, may have not had the same access to transportation or to infrastructure improvements or to low income populations. As I said at the beginning, there's not a switch that we can flip and suddenly something is complete. It's sort of a continuum. Um, it does apply to every context, the complete streets approach, but it doesn't necessarily look the same in every context. Not every corridor is going to have all of the same facilities, but let's look at a few examples. Um, in a rural context, if you're in a location where you're very far from very specific destinations, um, it's very likely that you're only going to have that highly confident road user out there biking along a corridor like that. So simply providing something like a shoulder can make that street satisfactory and more complete for that particular type of road user. Um, alternatively, as you get closer to a town, you might want to be rethinking that for the, the less confident, um, more casual bicyclist, and also certainly your pedestrians because you're closer to destinations. But this is the shoulder in a rural context might be making your street more complete for all road users. If you're in an area where you do have some very specific destinations, like if you have a couple of towns that are in close proximity, or if you have a, a recreational destination in that rural area, then a shared use path is going to be a, a type of facility that's going to be, make that complete for all ages and abilities. When we get to our rural small towns, that's where we're going to start using those treatments that look very much like an urban context, where we have crosswalks and sidewalks and bike lanes and other types of facilities, treating that town much like you would an urban context because people can walk and bike within that distance. In higher density neighborhoods, we want to be thinking about crossing locations. If, if it takes a thousand foot walk to get to the next crosswalk, how likely is someone to walk that distance? And if they're trying to get to the bus stop on the other side of the street and they see that bus approaching, how likely they, are they to make a risky choice and cross without those enhancements? Um, or will someone end up staying home or choosing another mode of traffic simply because they cannot fathom getting out into traffic without having some means of crossing the street in a convenient place. So being thoughtful about where those crossing desire lines are and, and providing the features to make it possible for people to do that. But also thinking about the overall roadway context, thinking about the speeds happening at those crossing locations and the number of lanes that are having to be crossed and all of those other factors as we design those crossings. We haven't talked a lot about freight, but as we are adding features to our roadway network, we don't want to forget about our freight um, delivery drivers and our delivery vehicles. Um, it's, it's great to be able to go walk to your corner coffee shop and your walkable community, but that corner coffee shop needs to get deliveries of paper products and coffee beans and pastries and newspapers and all of those things for you to be able to experience them at the coffee shop. So we need to provide space for those deliveries to happen. And also remember that those delivery drivers, they are also pedestrians when they get out of the truck and they are usually carrying some sort of hand truck or, or some sort of device to, to carry their load. They might need some sort of ramp. Um, and also thinking about how long a delivery driver has to stay in one location to make those deliveries? Um, do you have a development where they have to go to several different storefronts to make all of their deliveries? Or is there a centralized delivery point? And that can be something that's considered in development plans as they are advanced. And then we have transit opportunities on our corridors. And this is one of those things that um, 
can be challenging because usually the transit agency is is a whole different agency than the the agency who is overseeing the street network and you both have an obligation for making sure that those transit stops are useful and accessible to our um, transit users but also thinking about how you get from the transit stop to your final destination because very rarely is that transit stop right in front of your house or right in front of the store that you want to go to. So when we're thinking about our complete streets, just a reminder of all the things that they include. A complete street is safe and feels safe for everyone using the street. Um, they're planned, designed, and operated to prioritize safety, comfort, and connectivity to destinations for people who use the street network. A complete streets include pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, micromobility, shared ride, motorists, and freight. The goal is to provide an equitable and safe transportation facility for travelers of all ages and abilities, including those from marginalized communities facing historic disinvestment. So let's look at a couple of examples. This is the town where I live. Um, I'm, I'm in Colorado, and uh, I don't want you to think of the mountains of Colorado Colorado, think of the plains. Imagine a whistle stop in Kansas and you've got the picture right. Um, the population of the town itself is about 3,000 in the town proper. Um, we have US 40 that goes through the center of town. We also have a railroad line and we have a freeway um, interchange. Um, within the community, we have schools, we have a Mexican restaurant, we have a couple of gas stations, we have a radio shack, um, we have a health clinic. Um, we don't have a library. Um, we also don't have a grocery store. We have to go to the next town for those amenities. Now I'm gonna back out a little bit so you can see the surrounding area. You can see there's development in specific areas and then we have a lot of rural open space. So there's the town of Strasbourg, and that's about a one mile distance from one side to the other of that circle. That's a very walkable distance and covers the entirety of the center of town. Now, if you look at a five mile circle, look at how much development that picks up. That picks up those outer lying neighborhoods, those outer developments. It also picks up um, isolated farmhouses. So if we had a bikeable network that covers that entire area, um, it would allow people to get on their bike and ride into town or ride over to a friend's house. Backing out a little bit further, um, notice in the center it's still Strasbourg and um, then to the east of us there's the town of Byers. It's about six miles away. That's where our nearest library is. That's where there's also a little small grocery store. And then to the west of us is the town of Bennett. It's about nine miles away. And that's where we have the, our, our closest nationwide grocery store. There's also a school that has an audio visual um, theater. So that's where all of the theatrical events that the schools have are, are held. And so there's a lot of connections between these three communities. And this is where it would be nice to have a connection between those communities, something like a shared use path. That would allow people that live in between to go either way to get to one of those towns. And even though it's a little longer distance, because there are specific destinations, um, there are people who would use a bike to get from Strasbourg to Bennett or Strasbourg to Bayer or even Byers to Bennett um, if they were going for a job or going to get to the DMV or um, use the rec center that is in Bennett. Now here's a little bit more of an urban example, but I just wanna illustrate how um, even when we're getting to the design phase or maybe when we're giving permits for a development, 
how just a few subtle changes can make a huge difference in terms of making a street more complete. And this is the Orange Blossom Trail in Florida. It's in the Orlando area. It is um, a state highway. And I just want you to notice this one particular entrance. Now there are some really great features here. They have sidewalks, they have a nice landscaped buffer between the sidewalk and the roadway. They also have bike lanes and they have some, some nice bike lane markings, but perhaps we can make it a little more comfortable because this is a higher speed roadway. There are a lot of lanes, there are some opportunities. So looking at the conflict point where motorists are crossing that bike lane, maybe we can use some um, green markings to make it more conspicuous. Perhaps because we have so many lanes, we can borrow just six inches or a foot from each of those travel lanes to create some buffer spaces around that bike lane. And remembering that there's cars on both sides of the bike lane, let's put a buffer on both sides. We can enhance it even further by providing some sort of vertical element, making it a separated bike lane which provides more positive control, um, prevents those um, last minute decision makers from crossing into that, that turning space um, where they would be unexpected. Now looking at the driveway entrance proper, um, certainly we're gonna continue our separated bike lane. And I want you to notice that it extends halfway across that driveway. Well, we already have a raised island in that roadway that we're, we've already prohibited left turns in that space. So why not provide the protection across the, the driveway for those bicyclists? Now, remembering that all the vehicles that are turning into this driveway are gonna have to slow down or they have the opportunity to slow down because they're in that turning lane. They're not going to impede through traffic so we can expect them to slow down considerably. So we don't need that wide sweeping turning radius that we have there. So perhaps we can tighten that up a little bit. And by doing so, we have reduced the length of the conflict or the exposure to conflicts that pedestrians experience. Um, and certainly we can add some high visibility crosswalk markings, making sure we have our curb ramps and so forth. And then because we've tightened up that radius, we can also um, increase the protection that we're, we're providing for that bike lane or that um, separation that we're providing for that bike lane. Notice that we've shortened that exposure length considerably for the bicyclist as well. So these are just a few features. We haven't taken away the driveway. We haven't um, removed any mode of travel. We haven't even reduced the number of motor vehicle lanes and yet we've made it much more complete than it was before. And I just wanna add, you also wanna be thinking about freight. Maybe not every driveway entrance needs to be designed for that freight vehicle. But if you do have a driveway entrance that does need to accommodate freight, maybe you can do a truck apron on that corner radius, much like you would have a truck apron around the center of a roundabout allowing that occasional freight vehicle to come in to that entrance, but still controlling the prevailing automobile traffic and helping them make a better choice to take that corner at a slower speed. FHWA has a lot of tools and resources promoting um, what we call our proven safety countermeasures. And many of these relate directly to complete streets things like speed safety cameras and setting appropriate speed limits, using things like rectangular rapid flashing beacons and bike lanes and, and conspicuous pedestrian crossings, um, even roundabouts and road safety audits and road diets. These are all features that can help us make our roadways more complete. And we have numerous publications to help us um, guide our decision-making and, and help make the right choices. And just in the last year, um, our Complete Streets Working Group has been um, putting together information to populate our Complete Streets webpage. It doesn't have a lot there yet, but things are moving quickly. You'll, you'll, if you navigate there, you will find some, some great resources. Right now, we have information on the Safe Streets for All program, as well as the report to Congress on Complete Streets. And we also have some examples of how you might transform um, what one street type 
is into another street type. And there's a, several different examples of those transformations. So what's next? Well, in our report to Congress, we made some commitments. And I'd like to share those with you here. So first, improving data collection analysis to advance the safety for all road users. Ensuring rigorous safety evaluation during project development and design to help prioritize safety outcomes across all project types. Accelerating adoption of standards and guidance that promote safety for all users and support innovation in design. Clarifying the primacy of safety for all users and the interpretation of design standards guidelines, and project review processes. And finally, elevating complete streets as the default approach for funding and designing on non-access controlled roadways. So as I conclude, let me just ask you, where do you see yourself? Um, there's a lot of different roles that we play um, as we are managing and planning and designing and maintaining our roadway networks. If you're in a smaller community or if working for a smaller agency, you might fill many or all of these roles. And there is a place for complete streets in the decision making of all of these um, aspects of the job. Um, I've included some great resources and tools. I hope you'll take some time to explore further. And thank you very much for the opportunity to um, share some thoughts on complete streets. Perfect, thank you so much, Brooke. Um, and at this time, we are gonna take questions. If you do have any, please put them into the question pod. Um, I do wanna also point out on the screen right now is Brooke's email address if you do have additional questions or need additional resources that we aren't able to ask her during today's webinar. Um, and something else that I forgot to mention, Brooke showed a lot of resources that are available, um, a lot of covers of books that are available to you as well. If you'll notice on the side of today's PowerPoint presentation, there is a handout pod. I would encourage you all to download that PDF of today's presentation, um, and you will have access to all of the links that Brooke shared, as well as all of the links that our other two speakers will, will share too. So at this point in time, um, while we're waiting to see if there are any questions that come in, I am gonna ask Dana to go ahead and put our poll question up that we have for all of you in the audience. The first poll is true or false, a complete street prioritizes and provides safety, comfort, and connectivity, includes all modes, and is equitable for all. And again, we'll just give you a few seconds here to answer that, and then we'll address the answers. Okay, Dana, if you wouldn't mind, um, please showing that answer. And Brooke, we're gonna have you go ahead and address it once it's up on the screen. Well, it looks like everybody, or most everybody agreed with this definition of complete streets, that it's providing safety and comfort and connectivity, includes all modes and it's equitable for, for all. Um, this, is, this is a definition that we're using it at FHWA, but I would, would also add that a, a complete street is going to vary based on context. And so you, know, you have to be very thoughtful about the needs and the desires in a particular community and be sensitive to that. Perfect, thank you. And we do have a few questions that came in for you, Brooke. I'm gonna ask just, just one or two here now and then move along to our other speakers and we'll go back to any other questions after that. The first one is the idea of building complete streets with safe facilities for all road users is great. Sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> is great in um, unconstrained situations, but how do we balance trade offs when there are clear? Um, constraints on all aspects of roadway design, for instance, roadway width, 
uh, how funding can be spent, capacity and operational standards, et cetera. So again, that was how do we balance trade-offs? That's a great question. And it's gonna vary very much from place to place, certainly in terms of what your priorities are. But I, I would emphasize that, you know, not every street is going to be complete for all road users, but we do wanna think about a complete network. So maybe you'll have one corridor where you're emphasizing the motor vehicle traffic or, or the freight traffic just because of the type of development along that corridor because it's, it's important for those uses. But then you might be looking for a parallel corridor where you can provide the, the higher comfort pedestrian bicycle network and then just making sure that where those two meet or intersect or where there have to be crossings that you provide um, some some good crossing opportunities um, between the two modes. So that's one way to think about it. The other way, um, you know, particularly, this is particularly more challenging in some of those ur urban contexts, or even in those rural contexts where you just have one corridor that goes through town and there, there's not a lot of connectivity otherwise. That's where you end up having to make some really tough choices. Um, I like to reference the example in the Netherlands on how they became a bicycling nation. Um, we talk about them a lot and, and maybe we discount them because it's like, oh, well, that's the Netherlands. They all, they all bike, but they haven't always been that way. It was in the 70s and 80s where they made some very conscious choices to make some tough decisions. Um, one community that I like to, to note the example of, they as they were, looking at tearing down historic neighborhoods to build um, motor vehicle highways through their communities, um, they got pushback and they decided to, to pivot. They ended up making building a ring road for the motor vehicles and you can drive into any part of that community, but you can't drive across that community from one sector to the other. You have to go back out to the ring road and go around but you can very conveniently walk, bike, or take transit back and forth anywhere across the community. So they really emphasized those other modes of travel once you got into town and, and tried to push the car traffic into a different space. Very tough choices to make. Um, I know we've looked at some examples in California in some very urbanized areas, and they're really having to be thoughtful about growing the alternative modes while de-emphasizing some of the other modes so that in, in an evolving process to try to provide those opportunities for walking and biking and help people take those shorter trips. Um, more than, I think it's more than half of our trips that we take in the US are one to three miles in length, which is very walkable, very bikeable and and so if we can help people make those choices because it's safe and convenient, then we can start changing the balance of what we do in our infrastructure. Another question, Brooke, relates to the resources that you talked about. Um, so they're wondering if any of the resources shared are interactive. Um, they're developing a complete street policy and are needing to provide educational sessions to elected officials and believe an uh, interactive component would be beneficial. I'm not really aware of anything in particular that's interactive. Certainly several of them are videos um, which have a really good um, case studies of other communities and how they've implemented complete streets. And I have um, quite a few videos that I've collected. They're just YouTube videos that are, are some great examples for various contexts that might be useful that way. But in terms of an interactive aspect, I don't know that we have anything in that regards that's sort of a, but while I will mention that um, there are, there is a um, self-paced NHI course, a National Highway Institute course that is on designing and planning for bicyclists. Um, that is available, um, that might be something that would be useful if you're focusing prin principally on bicyclists.
And we do have a lot of questions left in here, um, but I am at this time going to move to our next presenter just to make sure we have enough time for all of them. Um, after the fact, I will provide these questions to our trainers and see if they have answers to any of them and we'll be able to send those back out um, with the recording for today. So at this time, Dana, if you could please move us to the next slide. Um, I'd like to introduce Jackson Hoteling. He works with Missourians for Responsible Transportation as a Community Engagement Coordinator, where he travels around Missouri and meets with community leaders and citizens who want to increase active and public transportation options for all Missourians. He combines his passion for meeting new people and learning from others in order to build relationships, share resources, listen and engage on a multitude of issues to move the needle for improved transportation equity in Missouri. Jackson has supported Complete Streets advocacy by promoting and implementing MRT's model Complete Streets policy template for large and small rural communities across Missouri. While Jackson was raised in Missouri, he has traveled internationally to 53 countries and more than 2,000 U.S. counties. And through these experiences, he quickly realized how important accessible transportation options are to meeting basic needs. Um, and I was able to meet Jackson last week at a conference, and I'm very excited that he's here to speak with us today, especially because I do know he is actually out doing some um, safety audits in the field today. So um, we appreciate him going into an office and taking some time out of his day to present today. So Jackson? All right, thank you, Jamie. And uh, thank you, Brooke, for the introduction to Complete Streets. Um, let's get started here. Um, I'm going to be talking specifically from an advocacy perspective today. I work with a nonprofit that I'll get into. Um, and we really focus on uh, active transportation options, uh, focusing on complete streets policies and implementation when we can, uh, primarily in rural Missouri. Um, so to get started with this presentation, I wanted to give a quick introduction to our organization while also recognizing that we are one among many that's trying to implement and work with communities towards implementing complete streets concepts. Um, I wanted to give as well a background for complete streets in Missouri, um, focus on some of those community engagement aspects that were uh, really um, have found successful, um, and also to talk a little bit about the ordinance template and the planning uh, aspects that we have. Um, so to give an introduction of our organization, um, we are Missourians for Responsible Transportation. Uh, so our mission is to be the leader in fostering strong communities by ad aligning advocacy efforts for streets, roads, and trails that work for all Missourians. So we're actually a partnership. Uh, we were founded in 2018, um, but actually um, dating back more than 30 years, there have been uh, entities uh, within urban areas in Missouri uh, focused on active transportation advocacy for a long time. Um, so there were four separate organizations uh, based independently in the four largest cities of the state. So it's Local Motion in Columbia, uh, Bike Walk KC in Kansas City, Ozark Greenways in Springfield, and Trailnet in St. Louis. So they recognized that while they had really uh, strong relationships that they've been able to build, uh, strong coalitions that they've been a part of within those urban areas, uh, they don't necessarily have the same access to rural communities uh, within the state. Uh, sometimes there is some animosity to people, you know, coming in with urban ideas to a rural area, trying to change things. And, you know, while we recognize that rural folks are really the people that might need some of this support the most, um, it's really just trying to find that bridge. Um, so what they did, they came together 2018, like I said, uh, they created the statewide partnership uh, that I work for. Um, so they've been able to have great success so far uh, working in rural communities across the state. Um, here's a map of the communities that we've been able to work in since 2018 on a variety of projects. Uh, some of those projects are specific uh, infrastructure related projects. So the green squiggly line you see there, that's a Rock Island Trail Corridor. Um, that's something that we worked with a, a large coalition across the state and with state parks, other state entities um, to get that accepted as an active transportation project. Probably one of the biggest that we've had in decades. Um, that will string across uh, 23 communities along that uh, future trail. Um, otherwise, we've been uh, sporadic in certain areas, but if you'll see, um, this blue collection of dots here is something that we've really been learning. Um, it's trying to focus on 
uh, working on complete streets within a regional perspective. So we've worked on a few specific grants uh, within communities within the Kaysinger Basin Regional Planning Commission here, um, for example. So that's actually one of 19 regional planning commissions. And we're finding that working regionally um, has been hugely successful in improving these complete streets projects that I'll be talking about uh, further on. So to continue, I wanted to give a quick background of complete streets here in Missouri. We already heard a definition, um, but just visually I want you to uh, kind of have an understanding of what many of the communities we work in might look like. So uh, just to give a couple of different examples, uh, to the left is uh, within the community of Windsor, Missouri. Uh, that's a community that they've laid some of their sidewalks more than 80 years ago. And with just about 2,000, 2,500 people, it's really expensive on their own to maintain those kinds of projects. Um, through working with them and through their own um, interest and investment in um, developing the trail system, they've actually been able to help establish a, a transportation tax to address some of those needs, uh, which we're really excited about. Um, to the right here is actually a photo I took yesterday. Um, something I'll be highlighting down the road in this presentation is that we need to really listen. Um, the community really knows what's best. Um, I was actually told about a certain area in Butler, Missouri, where this photo was taken, um, that a lot of people are walking back from Walmart with multiple miles to get groceries. Um, you know, they didn't promise that I would see anybody doing it, but sure enough, I go, um, you know, see somebody actually crossing through under a really dangerous area with no sidewalk infrastructure or biking of any kind. So this is a state highway um, that this goes through, and this is something that is very common that we'll see out on the outskirts of rural communities and between communities as well. Um, so like we heard, um, we've worked with the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is um, under the umbrella of the Smart Growth America, um, to help us develop our understanding of what complete streets are. But yeah, we look to Federal Highway Administration as well. Um, we really just want to nail down that complete streets are roadways that are designed for all modes of transportation, all kinds of users, whether they're in a car, whether they're riding a bicycle, walking, using a wheelchair. Um, roads that can accommodate for everybody is really what we want to focus on here. Um, in Missouri, we've recognized this for quite a while, um, that there is a need. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting a third of Missourians do not have a driver's license. Uh, that's really kind of one of the most shocking facts for me. But when you think about it, uh, elderly folks, you know, they might lose their access over time or younger folks below 16, um, which is the legal age for driving in Missouri. Um, you know, people might have had a DUI in the past, lose their license. Uh, people might not be able to afford a car. Uh, around the U.S., about 40% of people with disabilities don't own cars or operate cars. So really all people in some way are or can be affected by not having access to a personal automobile. So anyone that's outside of that realm uh, really relies on complete streets when possible and you know faces the con consequences of safety uh, issues when, when those are not provided. Um, so in Missouri, uh, we generally have a focus at this point um, on maintaining what we have first. That's a common thing we'll hear uh, from the Missouri Department of Transportation. Uh, we have 33,000 miles of roadways. Um, most of those do not have any kind of pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure like that. So when we focus on maintenance, um, often the complete aspect isn't necessarily put into that because it wasn't originally. So we need to look towards alternative funding mechanisms. Um, but without really much of a, a planning framework or a vision for what state trail system might look like or having a complete streets policy, uh, we kind of lack the, the teeth really to put towards uh, making these kinds of changes happen uh, where they're needed the most. Um, so as I have here in this third bullet point, um, Missouri in 2012, the legislature uh, identified that a complete streets resolution um, was passed. However, without a policy, there haven't been able to be widespread changes across the state. So that's why we've really needed to focus more regionally and within specific communities when we can. Um, so in 2010, uh, a lot of the complete streets work in Missouri really hit the ground running. 
uh, the CDC had a stimulus funding that had actually supported creating a coalition and uh, an opportunity for discussion between State Department of Transportation and especially the um, Department of Health and Senior Services. So that's where the Missouri Complete Streets Advisory Council came to fruition. The broad coalition of partners and over time, they've identified four statewide goals that we really need to focus on. So two of those um, I had just discussed, um, creating a statewide complete streets policy, as well as a statewide active transportation plan, like many of our surrounding states have, um, as well as focusing on education. So especially for the engineers going through school at Mizzou, for example, um, our engineering school, um, you're not necessarily getting a lot of that discussion about active transportation uh, within those programs. And um, what is the main thread throughout all of our work is equity, just making sure that everyone is able to have the, the access that they need um, to get where they need to go. So to talk specifically about some of the community engagement aspects that we're working on, um, what we've really identified is when we're working specifically within a community, we really wanna have a grassroots and grass tops approach. So we recognize that there's some key individuals, um, you know, often it'll be a county commissioners or leaders of counties that are the, the folks making the final decisions, um, deciding what the priorities are for their counties as far as active transportation and road transportation projects. But they're not necessarily going to be the folks that are the vulnerable road users. Uh, in between that too, we've identified a third group that we really wanna work with, which are identifying community champions. So to break down those three groups here, um, focusing on vulnerable road users is really um, the basis for our work. Uh, we recognize that folks, like I said, have many different reasons for needing active transportation. We've had informal discussions and more formal discussions as well. These uh, photos here, are a collection of interviews that we hosted a few months ago. Um, these are all people that are impacted in different ways um, through um, not necessarily being able to operate a motor vehicle in a rural area. And they talked about you know, their daily lives. They talked about how they had to get from point A to point B um, despite having that support. Um, for example, the woman in the bottom right of that photo, uh, Sandra, she lives outside of Warsaw, Missouri, about seven miles away from a town. Um, she never needed to drive because her husband always had taken her everywhere she needed to go. However, uh, her husband died of COVID very suddenly. She immediately lost her link to go to the grocery store. She immediately lost her link to go to the eye doctor's appointments. And those kinds of things, you know, all used to be centered within one town, but the closure of rural hospitals, especially in Missouri, has been significant. So she'll have appointments dozens of miles away, uh, how is she gonna be able to access that when her link is immediately lost? So those are the kinds of stories that we're hearing constantly, but it's a matter of getting the folks that need to make those final decisions um, to listen, understand, and take that information with them. Uh, really what we've been able to identify are individuals that are truly the most inspired, have the energy, the wherewithal to take uh, what we're able to communicate with them to those leaders. So it's not us going and telling people uh, out in rural Missouri how things are done. Our job is to listen, connect them to resources when possible, and um, they'll find their own inspiration. Um, community champions are essentially folks, maybe they work in a school administration. They see the kids constantly crossing a state highway that has no crosswalk to get to uh, school every morning. Uh, we might see people in the county health department, something like that. Um, but these are folks that are really within the community seeing these issues day to day. And we want to connect them with what often ends up being, you know, groups of older men, frankly, um, in rural areas of Missouri that are some of those leaders. Uh, with this group, our goal is to really listen, um, as we do with the other groups, and establish trust. You know, we're not coming in from... Columbia, Missouri, where we're based to come and change everything in your town. Uh, we just recognize that we've heard stories from individuals that have serious challenges. And there's some easy solutions, but it takes time um, and understanding, working together to be able to make those kinds of changes possible uh, when appropriate. So it's really an opportunity to connect with the folks, you know, the old men at the table, 
the godfathers of the city or county, as some people might call them, that are the folks that we need to engage with um, to be able to make these things possible. And we do that in a few ways. Uh, one of the ways that has been really successful for us, and we've had specific grants that have been able to fund this work, but we've also done consulting for this, is working on walk audits. So these are very, um, just the on the ground opportunities for people to walk around their town, see and document the current state of uh, active transportation infrastructure in their community. Uh, so as you'll see here, actually I took this photo Monday evening, uh, we were able to recruit a cross country team uh, for Butler High School. And uh, they, uh, among some other older folks, uh, split into a couple smaller groups. And we went along different areas that they're very familiar with. So along the high school, high traffic areas where people are going to be walking and biking to some of the parks and going and actually seeing what that infrastructure looks like, taking photos, uh, which we'll be able to actually upload this information onto an app uh, with one of our uh, partners. And through that app, we have information that we can use to create documents um, that um, get end, up, end up using for uh, specific grant applications and things like that. So we found this is a really effective way um, to get people to actually see their infrastructure and to recognize and have those discussions on the ground about specific things that they might want to see changed. Um, you'll see here in the photo, the sidewalk ends. That's a very common thing that will happen. Um, beyond that, we do lots of trainings. Um, as Jamie had mentioned, I'm doing a training today. Uh, I'm with a group of folks. Um, there's a coalition of different communities and a grant that is funded partially through the CDC, administered by Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, um, called Active Living Communities of Practice. Uh, so we've been able to, in the past, um, take communities to our partner organizations. So take them to Kansas City or St. Louis, see all of the different active transportation uh, final products that we've um, been able to work towards within those different groups. Um, but we did something a little different today. We're actually taking these folks, which are mostly from smaller rural areas uh, with small populations, to a community with a smaller population. So we're here in Versailles, Missouri, a uh, population a little less than 2,000 people. And that looks much more similar to a lot of the towns that they come from. So really before the last few years, there hasn't been that much interest um, or understanding in active transportation, but the community worked together. They came to create a stormwater tax that also um, had some sidewalk uh, infrastructure component to it. So they were able to get some funding to be able to start developing their sidewalk slowly. Um, at the same time, there's some other community champions, as I've mentioned before. Um, in this case, it was somebody who worked in the local gym, you know, wanted to see people getting more active. Uh, really spearheaded with a group called 100 Empowered Women um, to raise money for things like bike racks and benches for the community. Um, so actually having some of those placemaking components um, that allow people not only to have the access um, through sidewalks and things like that, but actually to be able to stay and have a place to put your bike, walk around, um, you know, go visit a bike rack in town and uh, support a local business. Um, so just through that process and through the process here, we've actually brought in um, a traffic calming pop-up demonstration that we'll be putting up. We have a, a bike fleet that we were able to take people this morning out on bicycles to some of the infrastructure that they've been able to build in the last couple of years. The experiential learning component um, is far and away the most useful means that we've found to be able to get folks uh, to interact with their community in a new way and see what might be possible through discussion um, between folks from different backgrounds. Um, so finally, um, some of the more technical stuff that we're working on. Um, one of the most exciting things that we've been able to help develop is creating an ordinance template. Um, so, you know, while no Missouri community is the same, uh, we've actually been able to work with the National Complete Streets Coalition um, to create a template that uh, we're able to work with specific communities, looking at this template ordinance for what a complete streets policy says. And, take that back to their towns, talk with leaders, talk with other stakeholders, and try to develop a template that is unique 
um, and meets the needs of their specific community. So we've been able to use this template as a means of really, um, you know, identifying what what kinds of changes they want to see and how they want to see it. Like who would the partners be identified in the template? Um, that's something that we've been able to use in some smaller communities, so less than a thousand people. Um, it's actually being used in some larger communities as well, which we're excited about. And we've been able so far, um, since we created this in 2020, to create about seven complete streets policies, and we're in the process of more uh, between Missouri and Kansas. Um, we also really want to focus something we've identified as necessary is regional planning, uh, which I talked a little bit about before. This is where some of our regional planning commissions come in. Uh, Missouri being broken up into 19 smaller regions gives a much more workable area for what's possible while still being able to work between different communities. So this is an opportunity for communities to work together and to teach, recognize, and um, help folks understand that with planning, so with that planning component, whether it's a regional plan that's been created for active transportation or focusing within a specific community, I um, wanted to take this quote here from one of our colleagues, uh, Jason Ray, with the South uh, Missouri uh, Council of Go Governments. Uh, he says that funding follows planning. That's something that we really take to heart when possible and something that we see um, as necessary. Um, just to give a quick community examples as my time is wrapping up here. Um, Osceola is a community of less than a thousand people. Really before 2019, um, they haven't had sidewalk construction in a very long time. Um, however, uh, Teresa Hagen Lively, who's standing up on the left in this photo, uh, she was able to, to connect with folks. She's the, um, the economic developer for her county, St. Clair. Um, she is a hairstyling business. She runs an old historic hotel in the area. She sees a lot of people around town. So she's been able to work over years not weeks, not months, um, to be able to start to work on a culture change within the community. Um, she's been able to really help focus uh, getting a complete streets policy, which in Osceola is called a livable streets policy, passed. And since then, they've actually been able to help attain uh, different funding for projects within the community and out on some state roads as well, um, which is really exciting to see. Um, just in December, we helped get a uh, mid-sized city for Missouri, uh, Joplin, um, passed with the Complete Streets Policy um, due to a coalition of partners, but also with the transportation planner for their metropolitan planning organization. Um, so I wanted to give some credit to uh, Taylor Cunningham there, who did some great work um, and also had taken part in a Smart Growth America consortium, consortium there. Um, lastly, I wanted to highlight um, where our office is located. Uh, Columbia, Missouri. This is the fourth largest city. It was actually one of the first cities in the country to establish a complete streets policy, which was in 2004. At the time, it was progressive, but as as uh, time has gone on, other communities have identified more specific ways to change roads in a way that works for more people. Um, and basically, our partner organization has decided that it would be important to uh, Relook at this policy. So they're using the MRT model policy, not just for a small community, but a community of over 100,000 people um, as a means for being able to try to address some of those changes and make sure that infrastructure works for all Missourians. So with that, I will conclude and turn it back over to Jamie. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jackson. And again, I'll point out that Jackson's email address is here on the screen. Um, Typically, as you just noticed, we would do a poll question and take some take some additional questions. I do see a few very specific ones that came in for Jackson, and I will make sure that at the end of today's webinar, if we have time, we'll go back to those. Um, if not, I will send those to him by email and, and grab some answers from him. But at this time, I do want to make sure that um, we're able to hear John's presentation as well and all the great things happening in Vermont. And then again, I'll circle back um, if we have some time to do additional questions at the end. So John Kaplan has been working um, as the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator at Vermont Agency of Transportation since 2009 and has worked in the program since 2000. 
John is involved with project funding and development, policy, technical assistance, safety education, and promotion of bicycling and walking. He recently moved to the Operations and Safety Bureau, where he continues with the bicycle and pedestrian focus within the larger context of tra traffic engineering. He's been involved with bicycle and pedestrian planning and design since 1993, and I'm very excited to have him here to talk about some of the things that are happening in Vermont. So at this time, um, John, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's been great to hear the other presentations. And, um, you know, I think uh, what we've already heard from uh, Brooke and Jackson um, sort of set up my presentation really well. So uh, I think that'll work well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think most people, uh, when they think of Vermont, would think of a rural place. Um, I That's a pretty common description. So um hopefully the uh the examples that i have um will sort of hit home for folks and and be familiar um i mean our largest city in vermont is burlington that's around 50,000 population the whole state is i think it's around 600,000 so a small state sure surely um so we uh just short background you know we passed a uh complete streets law in vermont our our state legislature did in 2011. Um, it's kind of a very much a broad um, uh, statute that um, is is not super specific on like types of facilities. It pretty much says, um, kind of getting back to the now the federal highway definition of complete streets. Um, our law basically says that um, all jurisdiction so towns as well as the state will consider the needs of all users um, in all transportation projects um, there's a little you know there's more to it than that of course but that is fundamentally what the law says so we've had that in place for um, you know 11 years now so one of the first things I wanted to do was I think some I think there's different um, images that people get in their head when they hear the word rural um and these are both from vermont so you know in some cases we have roads uh like on the left that is um you know very much a undeveloped you know rural corridor without much kind of land use development along it um and we also have you know one of the things that um i have heard over my career is uh comments about the ability of people to walk and bike in Vermont. And I think sometimes in rural states, it kind of gets written off as, um, oh, we're a rural state, you know, we, people can't walk or bike here. Um, but we have a lot of downtown and village centers that look very much like uh, the picture on the right. So um, this is Enosburg Falls, population 1300. And you can see they've got a nice little compact downtown with, you know, on street parking, crosswalks, sidewalks. Um, and the kind of, uh, you know, sort of mixed development that very much supports walking, you know, businesses in close proximity to where people live and, and there's schools right in this area as well. So, you know, rural has different looks. And, and I think, um, you know, we've already kind of heard that, you know, complete streets is very uh, context um, sensitive. So, uh, my presentation, I really get into kind of the nuts and bolts of, you know, how can you make, uh, what are some ways to make streets work better for walking and biking? And I have done a presentation very similar to this. Um, in fact, I stole my slides from, you know, a previous presentation that I've given to a lot of um, road foremen around the state. You know, they, in many cases in our towns, we don't have big, you know, public works departments. It's kind of a handful of people with a road foreman as the head. And, um, you know, they don't have big budgets and they're looking for ways to uh, do things economically. And so that's really what I'm focusing in on. So um, one thing that I always like to talk about is just narrowing the travel lane. Um, there is some good research that um, on roads that are posted at 40 miles an hour or less, that a 10 or 11 foot lane is the safest width for all road users. Um, 
And so just, I, I call this a, a zero cost solution. So when a road gets repaved or if that edge line has worn off, like we have winters in Vermont that are hard on our pavement markings and they often have to be redone. Um, and that's actually a great opportunity to, you know, simply move that edge line in, make the travel, travel lane a little bit narrower um, and provide some more shoulder space um, for walking or biking. Um, and yeah, and that's definitely possible on a lot of, you know, lower volume rural roads. Then in more built up areas um, where, you know, it makes more sense to kind of carve out the space on the road for bikes and you have enough space, um, mark the shoulders as bike lanes. Um, those bike lane symbols are not super expensive, you know, um, roughly a hundred bucks per symbol. Um, and that just really helps to provide that space on the side of the road and, and designate that that's, that's where bicyclists are to be expected. Um, and then, you know, there are some maintenance issues too. So it's great if a road has a shoulder or a bike lane, um, but uh, material tends to gather in that area. And if there's no plan to sweep the shoulders, periodically, especially in the springtime. I know for us is when um, there's a big focus on shoulder sweeping because we use like sand or gravel in the winter. Um, so sweeping shoulders in the spring um, so that they remain usable because otherwise what happens is bicyclists will avoid that and be forced out into the travel lane where it's less safe. Um, and then uh, kind of getting to some of um, some other features um, not that signs are a, a total solution, but they are definitely part of the um, infrastructure that's out there to make um, facilities safe. Um, and just using the uh, high visibility fluorescent yellow green for pedestrian um, signs, especially. Um, so for school zone signs, which are what's shown in this picture, um, it's a requirement. Those have to be the fluorescent yellow green, but that color is also available for other pedestrian signs. And it really does stand out. Um, and that's basically no additional cost because it's just a different color sheeting. Um, another way to enhance visibility of signs is to add a colored strip to the sign post um, that is allowed by the MUTCD. Um, and the the colored strip is supposed to be the same color as the sign background. Pretty low cost, $25 per sign post. That's just, I did a quick search for that, those um, strips and that's what I came up with for a cost. This is another maintenance issue. Um, they, we can have great signs out there, um, but if there is, if there are things like, you know, uh, vegetation that's blocking the view of the sign, then it's not able to do its job and, and add to the safety of the whole system. So doing things like cutting tree limbs back so that um, signs are, are visible or just where the sign gets placed initially to make sure that it's visible. Um, just providing marked crosswalks. So um, you'll see on some of my slides, I have this uh, bullet about, you know, uh, so and so percentage of reduction in crashes. There's a whole um, document called uh, crash modification factors that you can look up. Um, and that's where I got these percentages from. So overall, when you provide a crosswalk, it's a 40% reduction in pedestrian crashes. Pretty low cost, um, you know, about $500 for a typical two lane crossing uh, to just to mark a crosswalk. And they really help uh, enhance that visibility of where pedestrians are going to be. This pattern, this is our state standard for what we do on the state system. It's just the block pattern. Um, it's, you know, the only sort of enhancement you could do to this is to put a line on either side, um, which then would be, I think that's called like the ladder pattern. Um, and, you know, this is the most visible to have these, these white blocks. Um, so this is uh, kind of a design issue, but um, kind of where parking, if you have on-street parking and where that gets located relative to a crosswalk. So there's actually a person right at the front of that white van that's waiting to cross. There is a crosswalk there. 
Um, in this case, the parking has been provided right up to the crosswalk. We um, typically have a buffer of at least 20 feet on either side of a crosswalk so that you don't end up with this problem. Um, and this is a kind of a mid-block crosswalk. And I've got a picture coming up of a bulb out, which is another great kind of another uh, iteration or further enhancement you can do at a mid-block crossing where you have on-street parking to make it safer. Um, so the in-street signs, um, these are another kind of visibility enhancement at an existing crosswalk. You can put these out on the center line just outside of the crosswalk marking to help um, has a little bit of a traffic calming impact, you know, slowing down cars, but also um, just adds visibility to a crossing. Those are about $300. Um, and, you know, they're designed to have a, you know, a big solid base that um, the sign will, you know, move if it gets hit, it'll just sort of bend over and then spring back up. Um, so kind of going up the scale in kind of cost and complexity, um, uh, pedestrian refuge island. Um, these are a great safety enhancement, especially for longer crossings. Um, just again, providing some traffic calming as well as breaking up the crossing into kind of two stages. So crossing one direction of traffic at a time and giving pedestrians a place where they can, um, you know, wait in the middle of the road safely with some physical protection with curbing and so forth. Um, I mentioned bulb outs before, so this is an intersection with uh, that has some bulb outs um, uh, kind of just uh, sort of on, you know, the viewer's side of the picture, there's some on-street parking. Um, and so that uh, allows for putting in the bulb out and still maintaining the travel lane. Um, these really help with visibility of pedestrians um, by motorists and it also puts pedestrians in a place where they can see um, oncoming traffic much easier. Um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. This is a feature that has is kind of recently, relatively recently available to add at a marked crosswalk. Um, again, at a mid-block crosswalk, if it, if there's some conditions where you know better visibility, you know, really highlighting that crossing. Um, is desired. These are a push button activated um, and you get those flashing lights um, up on the, the light bar on the signpost. Then just, you know, providing sidewalks in the first place. Um, often you will see these kind of goat trails, I call them, where people are obviously walking and that really shows that there's a need to have a facility there. There's a demand. Um, and without providing that, you know, people are forced to walk in the grass or sometimes they'll be out in the road um, and there's some obvious, sa obvious safety considerations with that. So um, just providing a basic sidewalk network is really important. And then, you know, if you are in a state that has uh, snow, then another maintenance issue is keeping sidewalks clear of snow in the winter. Um, people tend to, need to walk year round, especially if you're talking about the um, sort of equity considerations and parts of the population who rely on walking to get around. Um, they need to do that just to, you know, go about their daily activities, going to the store to get groceries and so forth. So, um, and that's also kind of an ADA issue. So winter maintenance is very important to consider. Um, Bike parking, this is often kind of overlooked, but an important thing um, if we're gonna encourage more biking and have complete streets is provide good quality bike parking at, at destinations and public buildings and schools and things like that. Um, and it can be very basic like shown on the top or kind of getting into a little bit uh, higher level of covered bike parking. If you know it's kind of long-term, this is in front of a large employer. Um, that you know, people were commuting to work, and it's a. It makes you feel good to know that your bike's going to be out of the elements if it happens to have a rain shower during the day. Um, I think Jackson maybe mentioned um, pop-up projects or demonstration projects. Just a quick sort of encouragement to 
use these at a, as a way to try out some of these things before making permanent changes that are more expensive. Great way to get community input and excitement about making changes to streets. Um, very low cost. You, know, you can do things with, uh, you know, uh, tempera paint that will wash away or just cones. Um, and it's a good way to kind of try out a design, make some adjustments on the fly and generate community support for projects. And then I always encourage with complete streets, like it doesn't always have to be a big transportation project. There's a lot of opportunities with other things that are going on. You know, if a water line's being replaced, maybe that's a good opportunity to update a sidewalk that needs to be, you know, widened or, or have the surface repaired. Um, or, you know, when a new development is going in, um, have the developer build some of the infrastructure that the town desires. So there's lots of opportunities. Doesn't have to be just the big transportation project. And then um, Brooke listed a ton of great resources. This uh, Federal Highway um, Small Town and Rural Multimodal Networks, or the I call it the Star Guide. Um, and actually, if you Google FHWA Star Guide, you will find this. Um, this is a great resource for rural communities. Um, I use this all the time and recommend that towns use it as a resource. Um, great illustrations, case, you know, um, actual case studies where some of the things that are in here um, have been implemented. So I can't can't uh, speak highly enough about this resource. So um, our agency, Vermont Agency of Transportation, we have a bike and ped design resources page that lists a lot of the federal highway resources as well as some state ones. Um, so um, I'm just putting a quick plug in there for that. There's uh, good information there, what, even if you're, you know, from outside of Vermont on how to make uh, complete streets. Thank you, John. Those were some fantastic examples, especially for rurals who don't always have a whole lot of funding available. Um, again, I'm going to point out that John's email is on this slide in case you have additional questions. Um, I'm going to go through just a few slides quickly and then ask one question of all of our speakers to wrap us up. Um, and then again, I will try and get some answers to the questions you all have sent in. It does sound like, based on these questions, that a second Complete Street webinar um, that, that really focuses on a few of the very, very rural pieces like uh, agricultural equipment, horse and buggies, and um, and fun, some of these funding things, and that a second one would be um, a great idea. So we'll keep that in mind here at the center and see if we can't put a second presentation together for you to address some of these. Um, a few resources I did want to also point out, um, Brooke alluded to the last two of these. They're in her section as well on the FHWA Complete Streets and the National Complete Streets Coalition resources. Um, but the two at the top are for uh, funding that is available. These are two links that are uh, fantastic to go to to find out what funding is available based on the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law and what's coming and what, uh, when they're open and closing, what's available. So I just wanted to make sure everyone had those two links as well. Um, some upcoming webinars for you all. Um, we're still waiting on dates and times for these two, but in August there should be a uh, Road to Zero webinar on putting it to work strategies and interventions in traditionally underser underserved and vulnerable communities. That's the second part of a webinar series um, that will talk about rural and tribal specifically. And then um, our monthly webinar next month, we're hoping to address motorcycle safety for rural areas. Um, we went through all the learning objectives and outcomes for you all. And then I'm going to leave you here on this page with our website and an email address to reach us if you have additional questions um, and to follow us on social media if you do not already. But again, in wrapping up, I do want to ask one more question that came in several times throughout this um, uh, question and answer period was about funding. So for let's start with John. Are there, I know you talked a lot about um, very low cost ways to implement some of these complete street strategies. Are there sources of funding that Vermont tends to go after for complete street strategies? Um, well, 
I know, you know, I'm pretty certain that most states um, have some kind of like bike and pedestrian grant program. We have one that uses some federal funds as well as some state funds. Um, I think all states have the what's called the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is a federal program. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, sort of what I would say is, you know, many of these things, because they're just based, you know, like the line striping, for example, towns are going to be doing that anyway. So I don't think that is, they may not look at it as a complete streets project per se. Um, that's just part of their regular, you know, road maintenance. Um, same with like putting in the, um, you know, different uh, colors, you know, sign backgrounds. Um, so I think it's a matter of towns, you know, or municipalities um, kind of thinking about complete streets as in a very integrated way with all of their other kind of road work that they're doing. And Jackson, what types of funding are you all using in, in Missouri to um, put some of these strategies in place um, and also for some of your walkability assessments that you're doing? Yep, so um, as far as communities looking for funding for infrastructure projects, the Transportation Alternatives Program or TAP funding will really be one of the main, uh, main options, opportunities for communities to look towards. Uh, the challenge with that, like we work with some communities that are 500 or less people, they won't necessarily be able to fund the 20% match. So that could be a huge barrier for folks and something we would like to see addressed. Um, but there are some other funding opportunities at the state level to help communities uh, meet that 20% uh, local requirement that would be required. Um, otherwise, for the projects that we're doing, a lot of our work currently is grant funded. So that allows us to go to communities, do the travel, uh, spend our staff time, um, and have uh, funding for the resources that we use to develop those kinds of walk audits and other trainings that we do. Um, so communities could connect directly with us on those uh, specific kinds of things. And then um, Brooke, from the federal perspective, are there certain funding sources coming out um, that everyone should be aware of uh, where Complete Streets may um, fit into the funding available? There are several um, funding programs that are going to be focusing on complete streets, and some of them are specifically for local agencies or advocacy organizations that the state DOTs can't even apply for those. It has to be coming from a county or a city or an advocacy group. Um, and I would, I would point you to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law site. And just recently, there was a series of webinars done about the Safe Streets for All program. And so there's definitely those opportunities to um, seek out those. And I'll also mention, um, I was just in the U.S. Virgin Islands where um, their tr local Trails Alliance is collaborating with their Public Works Department. And the Trails Al Alliance is getting um, donations from um, interested members of the community that they're putting towards these. And so, you know, looking for um, innovative approaches can definitely help. Perfect. Thank you all. And thank you everyone for um, attending. I am going to go back one more time to this um, resource page here on the top again is the routes initiatives um, list of funding opportunities that are currently open. Um, one of those is the safe streets for all. Um, so I would highly recommend that you go ahead and, and look at um, that information and the webinars that have been conducted on that. It's one of the sources that Brooke was just talking about. So thank you to um, Brooke, Jackson, and John for taking their time out of their day today to talk to us about Complete Streets. Um, and we will be following up with all of you with the link for the recording, um, as well as hopefully some of the answers to the questions we were unable to address during our live time. So thank you all for joining us today.